Good afternoon and welcome to our Views from the Top webinar series from the Chartered Institute of Marketing. Today's webinar is The Age of You, written and presented by Interbrand's global CEO, Jez Frampton. Jez leads the Interbrand network of 40 worldwide offices, delivering brand value generating services to their prestigious roster of clients. Jez has worked alongside clients across the world and in virtually every sector to create and manage brands. But before I pass you over to Jez, I'd just like to highlight a few key points. The webinar will last for approximately an hour, and after the presentation, there will be an interactive question and answer session. All attendees are muted, so the only voices you will hear will be mine and Jez's. You can, however, send chat questions at any time during the presentation. Just use the box located on your screen, and we'll try and answer as many of these as we can at the end. Finally, a link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you within the next 24 hours, and you'll also gain access to the recording via the opinion page on our newly refreshed SIM website within the next couple of days. Anyway, I won't take up any more of your time, so I'd just like to hand over to you, Jez. Thank you very much for a very gracious introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody. And um, as uh, has already been mentioned, I run the network around the world. And I think it would be fair to say that this uh, piece of work that I'm presenting, I cannot claim to be all mine. There are a number of us who uh, spent uh, some time early last year, actually, having done quite an extensive survey across the world looking at the wants and needs of C-suite players. Our, our clients tend to be uh, chief executives, chief financial officers, CMOs, chief technology officers, and of course a whole raft of different types of people within the brand and marketing area within businesses. So we wanted to understand what was on their minds. And the, uh, the output gave us a clue as to which of our services were most uh, important to our clients, but it also highlighted some new opportunities for us. Uh, but the more interesting thing that came out for it for us all was this recognition that there seemed to be a number of steps that brands were going through, and we were able to uh, identify and put names on these based upon the kinds of things that were on the top of, of uh, um, uh, business people's minds at different times over the last 20 or 30 years. And that's where the idea of the age of you came from. <clears throat> but before we get into all of that, I'd like to start, uh, start by talking about um, the difference between cars and horses. Um, hopefully now you can see a short video running. And um, the, the purpose of this is very quite simply to create an analogy between what, we, what was going on in around about 1905, which was when this film was taken. It's actually on Fifth Avenue in New York, which is uh, where our offices happen to be. And um, what, we, uh, what we can see here, of course, is cars and horses living quite happily on the same streets. And of course, at that time, cars were relatively new. Um, they came with lots and lots of mechanical problems. You had to put uh, petrol in them, which wasn't necessarily immediately available. Uh, whereas you could keep your horse, which woke up in the morning on its own, only required a bale of hay, uh, and generally did the same job at around about the same speed. Um, the interesting thing about this is that if you took a picture of the same street five years later, pretty much all of the horses were gone. So that shift uh, in terms of technology, if you like, uh, was very, very quick. But if you'd been standing there back in 1905, you probably would have been able to make the prediction that within such a very short period of time, the world would have changed uh, and would never go back in the direction it was. We believe that there's a great analogy here to what's happening to businesses and brands, is that as we, uh, shall we say, dive deeper into the world of digital um, and technology, uh, there is a divide appearing between different companies and the way that they think about their brands. So as we dive into that, it might be worth starting if we can, uh, if I can just move on to the next slide. By um, starting with the definition of what we think a brand is, this is, this is uh, Interbrand's definition of a brand. Uh, we believe that a brand is a living business asset. Uh, three very important words there. In other words, uh, they are constantly evolving, they are there to drive your business, and they should be viewed as an asset uh, in the way that you think about how you invest in them. And uh, if you do it well and bring them to life across all the different touch points uh, and manage it properly, 
it will create identification. People will want to be part of your brand. It will create differentiation. You'll be able to see why that offer is different from somebody else, and ultimately, it will create value for your business. Um, and if you take a look at what's going on with brands right now, it, it's a very, very accurate way of thinking about actually what a brand is to a business. Apple have proved that uh, um, we are dealing with more than just a computer where they, can, where they are concerned. Uh, BMW present us with the opportunity to buy, own, and enjoy more than just a car. Uh, and then perhaps more recently, companies like Nespresso have shown that uh, you know, even after the reinvention of the world of coffee by Starbucks, that you can actually create an experience which is more than just coffee. So I think it would be fair to say that the rules are changing, and they're changing quite quickly about what brands are, how they are built, and therefore how you should actually manage them. So let's take a little trip through time. <clears throat> it all started with the age of identity. The word brand is actually, I believe, a Swedish word. It's certainly Northern European, and it means fire. And we're all perfectly aware of the fact that at one point it really came down to the fact that uh, you know, owners of cattle or sheep marked their, their property. Um, that notion of a brand then became something which was applied to businesses. And a great example here of an extremely well-known uh, corporate identity and name with Coca-Cola. And during that period of time, the whole purpose really of a brand was primarily to identify the business to say this is mine, this is my offer, and therefore um, you can be sure that you're getting products which live up to our, our um, uh, or your expectations. And then as we learn more and more about brands, you know, perhaps at this point we're in the 1970s and 80s, <clears throat> and the goal of branding became about building differentiation and identification, something which set your products apart from your competitors. And as we um, went into the post-war age and markets began to saturate around the world, the notion of <coughs> excuse me, differentiation and identification became ever more important. Moving on to the next slide. This is during that period, the age of identity. This is pretty much how brands were viewed. They were something that lived within the marketing department um, <coughs> and very much related to the way that you looked and felt and the way that you expressed yourself. Then we moved into another age in probably the late 1980s, and we'd like to think that Interbrand was a contributory player in creating this, and we call it the age of value. At this point, brands became more than just a means of identification and differentiation. There was the recognition that brands actually generated significant value for their owners. <clears throat> and our low, um, ranking that we produce around the world every year, Best Global Brands, is a, a wonderful sort of like living, breathing um, uh, testament to the fact that brand value is important to companies. And it's now widely recognized that brands drill val drive value for businesses. Um, this is just an example of one of the rankings which has talked about us. It's, I, I always think there's something quite ironic, ironic about a ranking being ranked, but there you go. Um, and uh, as you can see, that according to PR Week, um, the third most looked at ranking for CEOs. So brands are important. They build value, <coughs> and uh, we recognize that around the world. But something bigger happened as well which is that the notion of understanding how brands generate value earned CMOs, marketing, and branding people a seat at the top table. And also during that period of time, as you can see on the, uh, the data on the right-hand side of the slide, we've seen quite a significant increase in the, uh, the average length of CMO tenure, which is a pretty good way of uh, determining how, uh, how deeply embedded chief marketing officers are within their businesses. And you can see that between, if we go from 2006 to 2012, a six-year period, it's, uh, it's to all intents and, and purposes doubled. Um, now, we believe that this is, on one hand, due to the fact that um, brands generate value and uh, CMOs, therefore, become an important business partner. We also think it's linked to the next age, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, 
um, during the period of the age of value, the primary requirement was to really understand in as much detail and with as much data as possible how the brand actually added to the value creation capability of a business. So, um, and this is an example just showing brand value plotted over time <coughs> and, uh, and refers to our 15 year long relationship with Samsung who went through a huge business transformation uh, and used the, the notions and uh, the elements of brand value as a platform upon which they then built strategies for their business. And as you can see, their, their desire was to actually overtake Sony uh, and they managed to do that within uh, four short years but then have gone on to uh, create considerable distance in terms of their brand value and indeed, of course, their business value. <coughs> During that time, we saw a distinctive shift in the way that businesses began to think about brands. They become uh, much more closely uh, aligned into the center of the organization, if you like, and can and quite simply be expressed as business strategy brought to life. In other words, understanding how your brand contributes to your business and therefore what you're trying to do with your business objectives then provides you the platform upon which you can make, uh, create an experience across all of the different aspects of your business from uh, marketing to sales to customer experience to internally looking at human resources. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's just take a deep dive uh, into how brands do actually create value. Now, I mentioned the best global brand study uh, earlier on. We've been doing this or something similar to it for um, uh, nigh on 20 years now. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, as I said, become a kind of a bellwether for um, how people look at the value of brands. And this is just an example of the, uh, the most recent table published in October 2014. But how do brands actually generate the value? Well, they create short and long-term benefits. And uh, if you look at it in terms of consumer behavior, they drive choice, they command a premium, and they help companies to secure loyalty. From an economic perspective, increased choice leads to increased revenue, a premium leads to increased profits, and a secure, loyal base of customers is a risk reduction mechanism uh, which many brands uh, can be seen to have relied upon over time, but again, that's slightly another story. Actually digging into the method of how we do it, we effectively look at three things. Um, how important the brand is in driving choice, which is what we call the role of brand, literally the percentage, and I'll show you some of that in a moment. Uh, brand strength, which is a measure of loyalty from a customer perspective. Uh, which basically predicts how far into the future the brand is likely to derive earnings. And then finally, the financial performance, looking specifically at, uh, at margins, earnings, and overall bus business results. And for the purposes of the lead table, we use published uh, information from Bloomberg and from Thomson Reuters. By bringing those three things together, you end up with a value of the asset. If we take a moment just to look carefully at role of brand, this looks at a number of different industries from one extreme, the luxury business, to the other extreme, energy. And to put that into simple consumer terms, what it means is that if you were buying petrol to put into your car, the brand is probably around 15% of that choice. In other words, there are a lot of other drivers of demand which have a much greater influence, like I'm just about to run out of petrol or I happen to use a petrol station which is close to my home. If you go up to the other extreme of the table and look at luxury, <clears throat> if you were lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on how you view it, to have a Ferrari in order to put the petrol into, um, the the role of the brand Ferrari and the choice of that vehicle is somewhere in the region of 70%. So an in incredibly important part of customers making those purchase decisions. So that's how the role of brand works. There's lots of different methodologies by which you can derive that. But let's take a moment to have a look at brand strength. This, as you remember, is the way that we think about longer term loyalty. And there are, um, you will notice very quickly, internal and external factors. We don't think that you can build a great brand on the outside unless you have a great brand on the inside. 
um, and consequently four of our internal factors there, clarity, commitment, protection, and the ability to respond to market change are key indicators as to whether or not you have a strong, clearly understood brand within your organization. And then on the outside, some of the factors that you might have expected us to look at, things like differentiation and consistency, but beyond that, authenticity, relevance, presence, and understanding. And we think that these are the ways in which you can focus and uh, uh, create very, very clear strategies to build uh, strong brands over time. Uh, and there is a direct causal link between a strong brand and a brand that plays a bigger part in purchase as well. So those two things, role of brand and brand strength, are interlinked. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about brand valuation is that the number itself is, is probably less useful in many instances than understanding how the value is created. And this is an example of how we actually use this uh, thinking with one of our clients around the world. And we actually map the 10 factors against their, um, uh, the way that they think about how their business works. And as a result of looking at it like this, we are then able to work with them to benchmark how well they're doing against their competitors, to understand where the gaps and opportunities are, and then go on to actually create um, uh, very, very clear strategies and in initiatives and priorities to enable companies to actually better invest their, invoices, uh, their resources over time. But let's get back to the main story. So there we are in the age of value. We're understanding how our brands drive value for our business, and increasingly we're able to use uh, that kind of understanding. It might be an ROI-based approach, but whatever it is, a means by which you can make better choices and better investments. But then something else happens. We enter the age of experience, largely driven by the huge shifts that are going on uh, driven by technological and digital change, which put much greater power in, back into the hands of the customers. And I use that word back very carefully because, of course, if you go back several hundred years, business was largely done on a personal basis. And for many of us, you know, we still have personal relationships with perhaps our local bread shop or butchers if you happen to have one left. Um, but the point is that the customer now has an incredibly powerful voice in the process of, of brand building and, and the, uh, the challenges which brand owners face in order to create very strong brands. And during this age of experience, in order to satisfy the needs of, com uh, of customers, you really need to be able to concentrate across all of those different areas of your business. We broadly break that down into four areas, products and services. This is uh, we're using the example of, uh, of Tesla here who have obviously uh, done a lot to try and change the way that people think about uh, electric vehicles, uh, and indeed changing the way that the customer experience works for them, how you buy, and how you become a longer-term customer. Fantastic example of people and behaviors is another important driving factor. Those guys with the blue t-shirts on uh, in uh, Apple are a walking, talking um, uh, personification of what Apple is about. Uh, and they bring to life the brand uh, perfectly within the stores in which they operate. The stores themselves, the experiences that you have inside stores, again, you see more and more technology coming to the fore, but the ability to create uh, an experience within a physical place, which again is in tune with your, your culture and your products and services, and of course, any communications that you may be doing as well. It's a great example of that. The polar bears for Coca-Cola, they're pretty much recognized all the way around the world. And the challenge now for marketers in the age of experience is actually to draw all of those things together and create something which fits together without any bumps, as one well, as my friends would say. Now, during that period, this shift towards the age of, uh, the age of experience, where you know, the, the primary approach was <coughs> the company out. Uh, in the age of value, how do we bring the uh, business strategy to life through our brand? Increasingly, the way that brands have to be built and managed is to create an ecosystem around the customer. Now, this ecosystem doesn't necessarily all have to be provided by you. In fact, we would say that going forward, companies have to uh, respect and indeed 
uh, engage in the fact that the best way to provide part of that experience may be through a third party. If you were a health insurer, for instance, uh, the fact that many of us are already wearing health bands and um, come two weeks' time when the Apple Watch is launched, uh, somewhere between 10 and 50 million people are uh, estimated to have had them on their wrist by the end of the first year. There's a tremendous amount of data which is being collected there, and maybe the most appropriate brand and way of doing it would actually be direct uh, with that company and to make a virtue of that to the customer. But the point is the customer is very much in the middle, and it's about architecting everything around them. So <coughs> at this point, we wanted to ask you a little question. And uh, we're going to give you the ability to be able to give us some immediate feedback, and we'll see what happens. So the question we'd like to ask is that many companies are actually in the process of trying to connect together all the aspects of their experience. So this is not something that one or two companies are doing. It's a worldwide phenomenon. When you look at your own buying behavior, do you think you're more inclined to purchase from a company that presents a very well integrated experience? Yes or no? <coughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see what's happening. Well, at the moment, I'm not sure exactly what the sample size is. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, around about 87.5% of you uh, agree with that statement that you would be more likely to buy. Um, oh, it's now gone up to 92%. You'll be more likely to buy where there is uh, a much more uh, coherent experience expressed. So it would seem that uh, our, our view on the market is uh, vindicated by your good selves. Let's get back to the presentation. So how do you succeed in the age of experience? Well, there's a number of different things that are going on in the world that we all need to be much more aware of. Um, first would be the in increasing importance of purpose. And we've used uh, Tesla here as an example, a, a company which is committed to zero emissions and zero compromise in the process of buying, owning, driving, etc. <coughs> Just in terms of the finish on the outside of the car, Elon Musk himself said that he wouldn't have anything go out of the factory unless the paint looks like a mirror. So yes, on one hand, they're uh, striving to achieve extremely high quality finishes to the vehicles, something which we would all expect from a car. We wouldn't buy it if it didn't live up to our expectations of a, of a quality vehicle. But over and above that is the notion that you are buying into a brand which has a very powerful purpose. In order to be able to really play in the world of experience as well, we also need to be very, very good at innovation. And there's, uh, there's two sides to this story, really. On one hand, companies like Apple, perhaps, are a very good example of a company who have, shall we have to say, internal intuition as to what we might, might be required next. Other companies rely a lot more on the perspective of the customer. But the common lesson is that we must apply our own creativity and innovative skills if we're genuinely going to be able to move markets forward and move customers in our direction. Henry Ford once famously said that if he'd given customers what they'd wanted, he would have delivered a faster horse. Um, and uh, another great example from a company uh, which I've worked with in the past, it's a, it's a, a CPG or FMCG company if you like, the creation of the washing tablet was a, a simple uh, observation in a focus group where two things were said and then put together, one of which is, I never know how much to put in, and the other one was, it's very messy. Now, the customer would never have sat there and said, I think you should create tablets, but by listening carefully to what people are saying, it provides a platform for innovation. <coughs> I mentioned earlier on that in order to create the age of experience, we need to be able to um, stitch the companies that we work with together in a different way in order to make sure that the customer service fits together with the product, fits together with the environment, fits together with culture, etc. Now, many organizations are still actually structured and organized as pyramids. And then within them, 
there are a number of different, uh, uh, shall we say, parts of the organization, departments or silos, or as, as they are frequently called when they're being talked about less effusively. Um, what businesses need to be able to do is to break down that uh, top-down uh, approach uh, whereby many different parts of organizations specialize in not working very well together to a position where you can genuinely create integrated teams because if you have an integrated team of people, you are much more likely to get an integrated experience. <clears throat> Understanding how to engage with your market in this age is also a tricky subject for many businesses. And uh, I apologize to anyone from BA or KLM, but it's a, just a great way of explaining the point rather than necessarily making a personal comment on what I think about each or either of these uh, um, airlines. One of the biggest questions is, why am I entering into the world of, for instance, social engagement, and how should I engage with it, which obviously should be driven by the needs and wants of your customers. So on one hand, we have British Airways, who have um, fallen foul of social media love, shall we say, a couple of times over the last year, once with a man who lost his cabin baggage, or his, sorry, his hold baggage on the way to Chicago, and then tweeted uh, to the uh, BA uh, Twitter account only to be told that it was only available between the hours of 9 and 5 Greenwich Mean Time um, and, uh, and promptly went ahead and uh, boosted that tweet and within two or three hours he was on the set of CNN talking to the uh, American public about the terrible experience he'd had. Um, so a great example of where BA could have and should have had a, a different policy in terms of the way that they use that account. And then more recently, uh, a journalist who was traveling on, on first class with British Airways for the first time, who uh, managed to find himself in a, in a seat in that cabin, which he felt was uh, less than perfect. And again, these things can be blown out of all proportion, um, and uh, very, very quickly it's covered within the news or social media. On the other side of the page, we have KLM, who regularly meet uh, and exceed the expectations of their cu customers, and indeed have won several awards for the way that they use social media. Um, it might be reasonable to say that perhaps KLM have got a clearer grip on how social media acts as part of their brand management process and their business management process. <clears throat> the other wonderful thing, of course, that technology and our the new way that we live can, uh, can provide is the increasing ability to provide contextual experiences. In other words, things which understand where you are, what's going on around you, increasingly things like who you're with and where you might be likely to go next. And the net result is you can create a sense of the brand being alive and with you. Now, in order to genuinely deliver that, of course, you need data. And uh, everyone talks about big data. Uh, we would say that one of the challenges going forward is how to turn the big data uh, on one hand into trend analysis, which we'll come back to later on, and on the other hand onto uh, much, much more detailed understanding of individuals or small groups of individuals in order to be able to provide that near personalized service that we all want and uh, expect increasingly from companies. And we would call this data humanization, the process of actually trying to seek genuine human insight into people, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and therefore what they might want. Moving on to that, of course, is that within this age of experience, creativity becomes as important uh, as it ever was, if not more so. And we're going to show you a short film in a, in a second when it appears. You may be seeing it already, which is of one of uh, the most famous pieces of advertising ever created, which was for the... Um, uh, the Super Bowl ad for Apple, in, uh, which was called 1984. The point about creativity, though, is that with all this new data that we have, which gives us endless new options to be able to target, understand, uh, track uh, behaviors, track attitudes, track purchase uh, processes, um, which give us tremendous opportunity in which to communicate with our customers. Uh, the flip side of that, of course, is that every other company that you compete against also has more information, more opportunities to more, communicate, more media availability. Uh, in that world, the ability to be able to take this insight that we have and turn it into genuinely compelling, creative interaction becomes more and more important. 
And of course, as we move into this age of experience, uh, and particularly an age where technology increasingly is leapfrogging each other every day, brands do become the true differentiators. Um, I remember many years ago that Financial Times actually put a quote out which said that brands will effectively become the only long-term means of creating sustainable differentiation within the market. Um, and Beats is a wonderful example of this. Uh, if you actually reduce uh, the um, uh, the product down to its uh, frequency responses. It's uh, in other words, its ability to replicate music or other sound. Um, there are other products on the market which are better. Um, in the same way that when Apple first brought out its iPod, there were better MP3 players. What Beats have done, as Apple did before, and many others have done around and, and will do beyond us, is to create a fantastic brand around that, such that you actually judge the product, product through that brand, through associated human beings like Dr. Dre, and the net result is that you believe uh, that you are listening to music the way that it was intended on one hand, but more to the point, it provides that identification and value creation for its owner. Brands are even more important in the age of technology. So where do we go next? If we're currently in the age of experience, then what's next? Well, we would call it the age of you. But uh, before we actually jump into what this is all about, I want to ask you another question. Um, and there's three possible answers. And the question is, to what extent would you be willing to offer greater personal information and data to brands in exchange for a more personalized and relevant experience? And as you can see, there's three options. I've got no problem in giving more data, only in certain circumstances, or no, I already feel uncomfortable with how brands are using my personal information and data. So let's see how we are doing on that. Um, and uh, yes, well, I think you're obviously a very cautious group who are listening in. Um, I think under certain circumstances, you're saying, I guess the question is, is to what degree uh, do we really understand uh, what data we're giving and how it's being used? And to what degree uh, in the future will we be given greater insight into that? It's increasingly interesting to see that the number of people who feel uncomfortable with it has increased actually just in the last uh, couple of moments while we've been talking. 26% of you saying that, uh, oh, 27%, it's going up, saying that you feel uncomfortable with it and you already think that brands are using data uh, perhaps in a way that you don't feel comfortable with. Um, we suspect that this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue uh, going into the next few years, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where it all, uh, all lands. Um, so, what's next? We call it the age of you. It's an age where there are 7 billion brands running around. Yes, you've probably guessed it, it's us. Uh, where big data meets the internet of everything and anything where supply chains are reformed around people, where the world will effectively become boundaryless, where data liquidity, the notion of being able to pass data information back with the board, will be as important to global commerce as capital liquidity, where companies will replace states as infrastructure providers, and where we will create and go beyond the notion of that ecosystem to the creation of a ecosystem which will better serve me as an individual. <clears throat> well, what does that all mean? Well, in order to be able to deliver the age of you, personalization will become more and more important. I mentioned earlier on the advent of, the, of health bands. Many, many of you may wear Fitbits or Jawbone or Nike or whatever you may, uh, may be using. Um, but, um, you know, in just a short period of time, uh, there's going to be millions of users of, uh, of the Apple iWatch, if you believe what the analysts are saying. In addition to this, of course, we're all creating lots and lots of individual data ourselves all the time through our social media applications uh, and a whole host of other ways in which companies receive data, your purchase behavior, um, your ownership behavior. If you own a car, there's, but the car is constantly sending information backwards and forwards in many instances. And again, what that will allow, enable uh, companies to do is to provide a more personal experience. We also have the notion of the Internet of Things, i.e., as uh, one of my friends called it, chips with everything. Um, in other words, there will be chips in literally everything that you, uh, that you touch, uh, even you know, the, um, 
elements of a door frame would be able to tell you when it's falling over. It's all possible whether it will be done or not. Who knows? But I'm sure you're all aware of uh, companies like Nest, um, and you're probably more familiar with companies like General Electric. Now, they have uh, decided to go uh, full hog into uh, the notion of Internet of Things, and they are putting sensors and chips into various different parts of their aero engines. Another big part of their business is uh, locomotives, where, again, they're not only just looking at the working parts, <coughs> they're also looking at the system effects in order to try and increase the overall speed of locomotives in, in uh, North America. And a great example here is that uh, one aero engine will generate a terabyte of data every day. And the challenge is to actually be able to write applications uh, and crawler software, which can then provide uh, insight into when, for instance, an engine might need servicing or where a part is likely to, uh, to give out on you. But then let's have a look at it from an individual perspective as well. Um, the whole notion of personal branding is something which we believe is going to become more and more important uh, to the point where all university students will, and indeed probably all secondary school students, will increasingly be asked to uh, look very carefully at the uh, social profile they are building. In fact, uh, one of the things that I advise my own daughter to do is just at the end of university uh, in a couple of months was to spend some time looking across her, her footprint, shall we say, on all of the different social media sites that she uses, because <clears throat> I just know that we, as a company, do indeed go and have a look at people's personal brands, They're the way that they express themselves through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through um, uh, any other social media site that, they uh, that we may believe it would be important. And on a personal level, when I'm looking for leaders for our businesses, I want to see what they're doing in the digital world, how active they are in terms of posting on things like LinkedIn, uh, and whether or not they have any videos on of them actually providing good insight into marketplaces. The net result of all of this is that not only do are we increasingly doing it, um, one of the companies that we worked with, uh, that we work with, who are into di digital imaging, um, uh, told me that. Uh, Something in the region of 70% of uh, all photographs, uh, photographs uploaded to social media by girls aged 16 to 22 are actually um, uh, edited before they ever see the light of the web. In other words, you can go in, you can change the hue, you can crop, you can do all of these things. This is effectively managing your personal image. So, <clears throat> time for another question. I think. And uh, the question is, do you actively manage your personal brand and profile online? And the three options are, yes, across all relevant, relevant channels and social media. In other words, you are doing this actively a lot of the time, making sure that the way you present yourself is all right. Uh, secondly, only in pockets or you know, occasionally with, with some room for improvement, I'm aware that I could do more in this area. Or third, no, not at all. So let's see what everybody is saying. Oh dear. Well, there seems to be, uh, uh, have, we, have we got the latest data back or are we just still waiting for it? Here we go. Oh wow, what well, a very well organized group you are. So 47% of you are uh, telling me that you do, you actively manage your, your brand, your, your appearance on social media. 41% um, saying that uh, only in pockets, bit of room for improvement. Oh, as more and more you wade in, there's more who are being honest and saying that they're actually in the middle. And there's uh, around about 10%, 11% of you who are saying that uh, no, not at all. I suspect over the coming years, and, and obviously if we broke down this by age, there would be some interesting insights from that. Um, but um, yes, this is something which is going to become more and more important for uh, individuals as we move on, uh, and certainly as they realize that they're building uh, a brand for themselves which has to fit together with other brands. With all this data that we have, with all of these chips in everything, um, and increasingly, as we start to understand what we want and how we should be seen, one of the next things which is going to start to overlay is uh, what's widely known as predictive or artificial intelligence, which will give companies the ability to provide a much more 
um, shall we say, timely way of touching you and, and, and interacting with you. Again, back to that insight in the area of experience about the um, importance of context. <clears throat> but increasingly, it will allow companies to be able to provide a near personal interaction with, um, with millions of companies around, customers around the world. And if you start to pull all of these things together, you have the ability to provide what might to the customer feel like contextual magic. Obviously, one of the issues here is making sure that nobody oversteps the mark and starts to feel a little bit creepy and a bit like Big Brother. Um, it should be built in such a way that the customer feels that the interventions are timely, appropriate, uh, and are not abusing uh, knowledge or understanding of you as a person. And as we discovered earlier on, it's highly likely that we're going to be a lot more active in deciding who we give our data to and what access we provide them in the future. So in that basis, you know, we, we would say we've been through the age of identity, the age of value, the age of experience is where we are right now. And the future is going to be about the age of you or putting it into perhaps more um, palatable business language, the notion of making business personal. Now, I should make a, a stress the point that you cannot jump any of these stages. Um, you have to have a clearly identified and well understood brand positioning in a marketplace. You do need to understand how your brand generates value. Uh, and increasingly, the things that we're looking at is how experiences create value so that you can decide where and how to invest. Um, once you understand how your brand works and can really put your uh, resources in the right places, the ability to create well-joined up seamless experiences becomes more possible. And with all that data that you have added together with everything that we're now able to generate for all of our digital interactions, you have the potential to become a horse, back to our car and horse analogies. Um, so we would say that the, uh, the dividing line now between the cars and horses is the companies who get their heads around creating seamless experiences whilst at the same time building the infrastructure uh, that they will require to move on to the next stage, which is all about personalization, the age of you, and making business personal. So just to leave us before we go into questions, a number of uh, questions that I'd like to maybe leave with you that you might want to ask yourself about you or indeed your business. First, what roles do you actually want your brand to play in your customer's life? What does it mean to them? Which moments in your brand experience generates the greatest demand? Many com most companies have a, a wide array of different uh, uh, points in time and places, either physical or, or virtual, where their customers uh, interact with them, uh, which ones actually generate the most demand and indeed provide the platform for differentiation. What level of personalization would, be custom, would customers be willing to pay, and in brackets, more for, because uh, otherwise all companies are doing is investing for no return. You know, this should provide a greater degree of uh, uh, a value from a customer's perspective. Um, it should provide, obviously, the ability to charge a premium, to generate more choice, and ultimately to create loyalty. In other words, to make your brand stronger. <clears throat> and how can a global brand scale up and at the same time create personalized hyper um, segment of one type of customer experiences? Fourth, why would your customer want to give you more of him or of his or her data. We saw some of the, the results from that earlier on. And how do you create innovative experiences given that information? Are you a car or are you a horse? And if you're a horse, what do you do to catch up? And finally, which of your markets or segments will most likely to be the early adopters of the age of you? Because it could well be that the market in which is your home might be less driven by this kind of behavior, um, but the market uh, in which you are growing might be more uh, driven to it. In which case, how do you make sure that you're ready for that? One of our observations is that uh, the North American market seems to be more ready to accept this way of thinking about business 
uh, Europeans are deeply skeptical about uh, secrecy and data, uh, and uh, Asian markets uh, in many uh, are rather more diverse. So you companies, uh, countries like uh, Korea, where there's a very, very high level of usage of data information, uh, versus um, countries in Southeast Asia where it is which, where it is lower. So understanding that mix of your customers, your markets, your segments, and your products, uh, and uh, and those segments which would be most likely to early adopt age of you are the ones where you need to make sure you get it right early. Um, thank you very much. I do hope you've enjoyed listening. We have around about 15 minutes uh, left for questions, which is, I think, exactly what we were trying to get to. Uh, and I do hope that you found um, uh, what we had to say useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jez. Uh, that, that was really fascinating and lots of food for thought there for everyone, I'm sure. Um, before I just go on to the questions, can I just say to everyone, um, if anyone lost Jez during the uh, video sessions uh, during the presentation, don't worry. Um, when we post the recording online, which you'll be able to access, as I'll explain in a minute, you will be able to hear those elements that, that you missed when you view it online again. So no, please don't worry about that. Okay. Um, We've been receiving quite a lot of questions, Jez, throughout the presentation, so I'm just going to put a few to you uh, now. Um, okay. First one that's come through is, do you feel there is a proven, or what, what is your view of the best proven and effective model for, for building brand? Um, well, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I think companies have done this in many, many different ways. I mean, um, if you'd gone back into the 1950s and 60s, then uh, the answer would have been do lots of advertising. And, and many companies actually had direct relationships between share of market and share of voice. Um, and then, of course, companies like um, uh, those of you who remember the body shop, you know, was famous for never having advertised. It was all done through the store experience and the product story. Uh, increasingly now we see companies like Airbnb and Uber, for instance, and Warby Parker, for any of you uh, who are familiar with them in the US, who are changing uh, the way that things work and are building their brands on the back of their platform and the way that they operate within the digital marketplace. So I suppose the short answer to that is that there is no one way. Uh, the, uh, the challenge of building a brand is, is really about understanding how your business comes together with customers. Uh, brands are the intersection of that. They're the means by which we can make uh, what could be very complicated decisions uh, much, much simpler for ourselves because a brand carries with it a whole, whole uh, raft of uh, tangible and intangible associations. So we mentioned BMW earlier on, you know, some wonderful statistics about how few people actually do test drives before they buy them because they are buying into what a BMW stands for, and it also has a lot of rational associations with it about what it feels like and what other people would think about you if you drive one. So the clue is to understand how your brand is going to work with your customer audience and, of course, internally as well, because if you're going to deliver a great experience on the outside, you have to have a strong brand on the inside. So there isn't, unfortunately, well, actually, probably fortunately for me and for Interbrand, there is no step-by-step uh, -step guide. There are certainly a number of things which you have to understand. You have to understand what your company is capable of, how your brand sits within its marketplace, what's going on in the minds of the customers, and increasingly, as I said, understanding your internal culture. Uh, and then understanding how to position yourself in a market and then build clear associations and understanding over time, um, are all of those things are relevant, which is why those 10 factors in brand strength, which we use as a strategic model to help companies build their brands, um, provide the, shall we say, 10 points that you have to get right, um, and then the way in which you deliver against it should obviously be unique to your business and your brand. So the way that you might differentiate yourself as if you are Tesla in a marketplace is going to be different from the way that you'd want to differentiate yourself if you were Ferrari. They're both well differentiated, but the nature of their product, their service, their ethos, and what they're about and what they mean to their customers is different. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Jez. And I, building on one of the points you made during that, somebody's asked, 
can you explain perhaps to a non-brand specialist, so I, th I think we've got a range of um, people in different parts of business listening in today, what do you mean by integrated experience? What's your feeling for, for a definition for that term? Um, I, I, I'm going to use the example of Apple actually because I think it's just one that lots of people are very familiar with and it's, it's fairly easy to explain it. Um, the integration of the way that their products and services work, so their, their products are easy to use, they are a pleasure to use, they're built around the needs of human beings, that's you know pretty much from their desktops to their uh, tablets to the mobile phones and I'm sure the watches when we finally get our hands on them as well. Um, so there's a, there's a sense of the, what Apple is about that's present in their, in their product and service. And Apple talks about itself as being you know, man, not machine. Uh, so computers or, or systems and technology are there to help human beings be human beings, not to turn them into, into machines. But if you then look at their culture, the way those guys in the blue shirts work, uh, it, it's very, they're very human in the way that they interact with you. Um, they're very down to earth, very simple, the way they're dressed, the way they work with you, the, the fact that they walk around with um, uh, technology in their pockets, which means that you don't have to go to a, a pay desk to pay. It is a store experience and a cultural experience which was built, built around people, not about turning people into cattle who are herded through um, a, a, set, a set experience. So that fits well with the brand as well. It's all about people. The store experiences themselves, similarly, they almost reflect the environment that you go into with Apple when you're using their products. Um, and then their communications, remarkably simple, very straightforward, very human, uh, and uh, again, very much geared around people and creativity, not computers and, and, uh, and boring old logic. So I think there is a great example there of how all of those different things connect together. The challenge for businesses, of course, is to actually make that happen. I had a conversation yesterday with a very big client of ours, and, and uh, you know they, they operate broadly, certainly in one of the markets in which Apple operate in, and we were discussing as to whether or not they should benchmark themselves against them in that particular marketplace. And uh, they, were, they were worried about doing so because they thought there'd be such a big gap. And we said, well, if you genuinely want to compete, um, then surely you have to. And then we went on into a discussion about, well, the way that the company is organized is just not going to enable us to compete uh, in that way, which, of course, then led into a much big conversation, a bigger conversation about how actually in the future they need to change the structure of their organization. So I think as companies begin to think about the, <coughs> the practical realities of trying to deliver uh, a, uh, a seamless and integrated uh, experience, they begin to realize that how much of it is actually to do with the way that they are internally organized, structured, and indeed how well everyone understands the brand that they're working with. Okay, th thanks, Jazz. That's really, really interesting. And, and perhaps building on from that a little bit, thinking about the customer experience, what influence do you think national culture has on, on uh, judgment and resonance, particularly relevant to a company like Apple that's operating internationally? Uh, well, the way that cultures perceive brands, is, is that what you're Yes, and, and, and the way that people engage with brands differently in, in different uh, cultures, I guess, the question. Well, it is. Um, I mean, it is different everywhere in the world. I mean, um, you know, a number of, most of our clients are actually um, pretty big international or, or multinational businesses. And uh, what you obviously find, you know, even if you take a company like Mercedes-Benz, you know, known extremely well right around the world, the level of understanding of that brand is different in different markets. And, you know, in China, you know, there's been a huge explosion, for instance, over the last five years of, of luxury car purchase. Now, many of the consumers in those markets do not have anything like the depth of understanding or knowledge that uh, a, a Western European uh, purchaser might have because of the history and the time. Now, that, that in itself presents challenges. I remember working of the launch of the Mars bar into Russia. This was probably mid-1990s. And we went and tested all of the communications that we were using in Western Europe and North America. And uh, nobody understood how this piece of chocolate could actually help you work rest and play. As a platform, you need something which is kind of a universal need. So the way in which Coca-Cola, for instance, interprets happiness in different parts of the world is different. <clears throat> because the notion of happiness is a highly personal one. 
Um, and the way in which Coca-Cola is, is consumed and seen is different as well, in the same way that they change the way that they present themselves when they're involved in uh, large sponsorships like the Olympics or the World Cup. So there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity required to manage any brand in a cultural context. Um, when we move into the whole era of the age of you, that becomes uh, perhaps even more demanding because on one hand you still need, there's a wonderful question on here about whether or not we uh, need to talk about brands in the age of you. Uh, well, actually I'd say they become even more important because what's going to happen is that when you start to build your own personal ecosystem around you in the way that we're already starting to control our social media um, presence, uh, increasingly you will become associated with brands and the way that you interact with them. So, and they will become part of your ecosystem. So understanding how on one hand to create a universal requirement or need, but then on the other hand to be able to deal almost at the level of the individual is a challenge. Although, of course, what you could argue is that many brands manage to do that already simply by being able to talk about something which is universally desired. Okay, I mean, it's a, a very interesting question has popped up here. Looking across um, different sectors, how relevant do you think the concepts of brand are to public sector organisations that are looking to get messages out there and, 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 put, and put points of view across and so on? And how um, well, behaviour? Absolutely. Well, I think this, um, you know, if you take uh, something like a government department, so uh, um, let's, let's take the NHS, for example. You know, the NHS is uh, a bit of a, a political um, hot potato at the moment, going backwards and forwards, and uh, there is certainly an opportunity, I would say, and, and no doubt into the future there's going to be continued periods of change around the way the health service works in the, in the UK. Uh, and during that, there's going to have to be some coherent means by which we can explain what the NHS is about, why it's important to us, how we fund it, why we should fund it, and all of these different things. And the process of building a brand around that so that people, as customers and users of it, users of it understand what they're going to get. Um, and, you know, it's, I think in, in many instances, you know, the NHS is, uh, is sort of sneered at. Uh, but obviously what you do get is that in terms of primary care, when it really matters, when the blue light is dragging you into the hospital, it's the NHS that looks after you. Uh, and, you know, in, on that basis, you know, we need to remind people that they are a, a life-saving organization uh, and, on the other hand, um, provide a platform whereby uh, an organization like that can manage change both internally with its people and also externally with its various different constituents or stakeholders. So I think that the process of building brands can work. I mean, we, we obviously do, we do work with many charitable organizations. I've spent a lot of time working personally with the World Peace Foundation. We work with Lauren Bush Laurent in North America on uh, Feed, which is uh, her um, charity about making sure that people eat properly every day. Um, so yeah, the, the processes and the, uh, the way of thinking in terms of building brands is just as relevant to charitable organizations, to non-governmental organizations, to commercial businesses, to whatever it may be. Okay, just, well I think that just about wraps it up. I think we're just coming to the end of our, our hour. So um, I'd like to thank you very much, Jez, for, for speaking to us today. Um, and that's all we have time for in today's Views from the Top webinar. And I'd also like to say thank you to everybody who took part. We've had some great questions come through, and unfortunately we've had far more than we could put to Jez in, in the hour that we've had available. Um, we hope you all found the content useful. Uh, on that point, we'd love to hear any feedback you might have, so please do complete the brief survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Um, and finally, I'd just like to add another quick reminder that a link to the recording of the webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours.